At this point, you've heard about two powerful levers that exist, Ability One and Section 503, with the same goal, to advance meaningful employment for people with disabilities. The next step is to figure out how these two initiatives can complement each other, and that's where this next panel is headed. I'm very excited um, to introduce our next panel. Finding a way for these two levers to work together will increase their collective impact, drawing on the strengths of both initiatives to increase the number of jobs available, the types of jobs available, and the accommodations and supports available to ensure success. So please join me in welcoming Jim Cook, Vice President of Strategic Engagement and Partnerships at MITRE, to help with our next panel. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Thank you, Joellen, for that introduction and the opportunity to facilitate this panel today. I'm looking forward to the discussion with, from our three guests today. Uh, joining us for, for the, this afternoon's talk is Dwight Davis, Chief Executive Officer for Global Connections to Employment. All right. Thank you. Steve McBride, Vice President, Operations for Skillskin. and Candy Chambers, Executive Director, Direct Employers Association. So let's jump right in, because we have quite a few questions and we want to make sure there's plenty of time for audience questions today. Let's start with you, uh, Dwight and Steve. Each of you have been spearheading some exciting initiatives that could really be key to operationalizing how Ability One and Section 503 can feed into other, each other and support expanding employment. Can you describe what you've been working on? Well, yeah, I'd love to jump <laughs> right in. So in our community, we're out, headquartered out in Spokane, Washington. And you know, when we're looking around, we're trying to see where we can solve problems. And we saw the trades is a big issue. It's happening all over the country. And we believe that people with disabilities should be a part of that. So we started to look around, you know, <clears throat> where are we? And, and how do we get involved? And it just so happened to be that I learned about, you know, these, the Section 503 requirements. And so was, we know some federal contractors. So we went and started talking to them. This is three years ago. And nothing for a very long time, right? It's, uh, these are big projects. They're building buildings, remodeling, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And they really need to trust their partners. And so we had to work on that relationship. You know, my, I had rose-colored glasses on. I thought it would happen overnight. Naturally, it took a little time. Um, but we just uh, put together our first project um, with a prime contractor, a construction contractor, on uh, one of the Air Force bases. And <clears throat> it was one of the impossible projects that they gave us. Like, <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> and can you do it in this timeline? And it was a big landscaping installation. And of course, we said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and it, I really know it was a test. And we, we you know, succeeded. We, uh, we did really well. And all of a sudden, we're now not seen as just an ability one group or skill skin that has the ability to facilitate some pretty large construction work. And so I've got on my desk right now a few million dollars worth of projects over the next three years. We are going to have to build that capability because <laughs> some of this is a lot more than just installing trees and you know, some landscape. <laughs> but that's some of the things that we're working on right now. Um, and I just know that the Ability One program can be a partner with these construction jobs. And we can help solve some of that uh, labor you know, shortages that are happening around the country. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Dwight? Yeah, that sounds great, Steve. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, Larissa, thank you and your team for, uh, for putting this on and uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about what we do and we'll, what more we can do. And so that's one of the things that GCE, several years ago, actually, were willing to take on a pilot in the, uh, the knowledge-based information technology uh, sphere. And I will tell you that I've been in the seat about a year and that's been the focus is to is dealing with the that contract and it's more important about what we learned as far as how that works that's a different culture than than we're kind of used to that and and I'm not talking I'm talking high end work then it's managing subcontractors lots of them that's a very fast paced industry um, 
you know, it's one of those where, you know, you're a traditional <coughs> NPA that's doing this type of work and you're working for a customer that, you know, tomorrow needs you to, to do a patch, work on an application that requires a certain programming language. I don't, I, I'm not Hewlett Packard or Deloitte that can go and reach across contracts or just reach into my headquarters and find somebody who speaks that language. And so we've learned you've got to have to build a bench, which means you've got to slow your roll a little bit and work the pacing, figure out what is appropriate. And then it really also kind of is on our customer as well, which is something that we really need to work on if you're going into this other, these other, what I see is where the government spend is going. You know, we're not seeing, you know, more custodial contracts. We're seeing a lot of this knowledge-based work. But it's educating our customers so that they know what, what it is we do, what we're about. Um, I mean, I was in Senator Rubio's office yesterday meeting with uh, his senior legislative advisor, one of his senior legislative advisors, and it amazed her that nonprofits did service contract work for the federal government. <laughs> Blew her mind. <laughs> you know, Lori can attest, um, you know, to explain that that's what, that, that's in the realm of the possible, and we've been doing it for a long time. GC's got over 1,400 employees spread out across 14 states. Okay, so that's, we've been working that. We, we're, we're into total you know, facility maintenance, and that is one of the things that we really are very proud of in that we have a contract where we have custodial and a piece of a facilities maintenance contract, and we're, taking, and, and we're filling those positions with our custodians that are ready, when they're ready to move on, then they come in and they, they, they start as helpers, and then eventually apprentices. And then the prime, or well, we're subcontracted to uh, another, uh, a commercial entity, and they hire our people and are now competitively employed. And so that's that evolution that we consider a success. Um, you know, in the IT space, back again, we had a custodian at one of our contracts at Naval Air Station in Pensacola. He liked to tinker with computers, took some night courses, and we had an opening for somebody to tinker with computers at the hospital <laughs> at Eglin Air Force Base. So we brought him over, and he started doing that, and he was good at it. And then he started getting interested in moving forward. So we did a little bit of training, and he started working the help desk. And then doggone it, the Air Force hired him <laughs> as a Department of the Air Force civilian. So, the, so he's now a GS-9. And he started as a custodian pushing a broom. Wow. Okay, those are the successes that we try to cultivate. And doing that means you've got to have that layered approach, starting with a place that they can get comfortable, you know, recognize their own abilities, and then work themselves through to get to where we see as a success where I lose an employee, but we gain somebody who's got the confidence and the skills to be successful without this program. That's a good, good story, thanks. So Candy, Direct Employers Association's done a lot of work <laughs> in this space as well. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've seen to date and also you can address some of the barriers or challenges that you've seen that if, if addressed would move things forward. Sure, and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, when I started at Direct Employers nine and a half years ago, I immediately said we needed to focus on finding resources for our corporate members to help them hire people with disabilities. So um, I'm excited to, to join you. Um, you know, it's, it's been a long road Employers, I think, need to be spoon-fed. And I, we have a 1,000 um, members in our organization and, and they're larger companies, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Apple, large companies. And the bigger companies get it. Um, the smaller companies or, or those that don't have a um, CEO that supports this you know, hiring of people with disabilities and focusing on um, you know, accessibility and that sort of thing, it's a challenge. And we find resources for them and we have thousands of resources and we work with Ability One. I'm on the leadership council with NOD. And so, I mean, we work with all of these companies um, and they're hiring more people with disabilities, but they're running into a lot of difficulties. Um, I, I hope this doesn't rub anyone the wrong way, I'm sure you're going to probably agree. Unfortunately, it seems that some companies don't understand the importance until someone in the senior office, the C-suite, has a family member with a disability, and then it's like, oh, we, we, we've, got to, we've got to start working you know, to hire more people with disabilities. 
And you know, if they looked at it from a financial standpoint, you know, revenues are up by, by at least 28%, a study that Accenture did a while back, another member of ours, um, in 2018, so it's only four years old. Profit margins are up by 30%. Any CEO would love to see those, those changes to their bottom, those positive changes to their bottom line. <clears throat> but you hardly ever see a company get an, a, a chief accessibility officer. They're all about DE&I, which is great, but you know, then you have NASDAQ saying that you know, you've got to have all these people on the board if you're part of NASDAQ. But oh yeah, they forgot the people with disabilities. You know, and, and that's, people, you know, the, the CEOs hear that, and it's like, well, you know, they don't have to do it, why do we have to do it? And, and then fortunately, it's, it's a situation where, I mean, I have, I, I have a disability, I've got one of the invisible disabilities, but I was talking earlier, um, what we get a lot of questions about, at least I do, um, at my office, is the self-identification requirement. Personally, I think when the regulations came out in 2000, not came out, but were updated in 2014, outreach and positive recruitment, I think, was brilliant um, because they want to see results and, and the utilization goal of 7%. Let's try to get people in the door that have disabilities. But going that step further and, and you know, having an accessibility officer and making it a public you know, statement that, yeah, we want to bring people with disabilities into the, into the workplace. And one thing that we do for a lot of our companies, um, our subsidiary does, is develop videos for CEOs to put on their website. Craig Lean, I've worked with him for ever since he's been in the OFCCP, and he recommended that. He recommended the chief accessibility officer. You heard him say it today. And I think that's brilliant. And that tells people, and when I, you know, it tells people that are coming to your door that, you must welcome, you know, you must welcome people like me. And, you know, if, if a person with a disability applies to your, on your website, what are they gonna find? Are they gonna find an accessible website or are they gonna find a, a, a note for an accommodation, how you get an accommodation and, oh yeah, you might get back to them in a week? The job's already taken down, they don't, they don't really have equal employment opportunities. And I'm all about accessibility and, and you know, so we, we send that message to our employers, but, the self-identification requirement is, is a tough challenge, and I was telling the folks at my table, because I have a, a disability, I don't like that word. I know some people do. It's just kind of like if you're, if you're African-American or black or American with African descent, which my best friend, that's what she prefers. Um, some people like Hispanic, some people like Latina. I don't like the term disabled. I, I had a member say that she you know, is a minority, but she doesn't like that term because it means less than in her word, world, and I wholeheartedly agree. Other people don't mind. You know, so you never really know the right terminology, but I have a condition I live with. You know, I've had it for 37 years, I have a condition. You know, and, and so how do we define ourselves? And, and you know, it's just something different for everyone, but the self-identification, People aren't always willing to say, I have a disability. You know, now self-disclosure, they might say, with d diabetes, they, I mean, doctors tell you, you've got to tell everybody you know. <laughs> if you're sitting at a dinner table, you've got to tell people you have diabetes because something could happen and they don't know what to do to help you. And if, if they know you have diabetes, that's going to be their first shot at figuring out what might be going wrong. A lot of people aren't like that. And especially, I think we heard Jenny say, um, mental health conditions. And that's, there's still a stigma, you know, unfortunately for people who don't have mental health conditions to say, oh geez, you know, I mean, I had a, I was at a conference earlier this week about conscious inclusion. And I said this the other day when I was taking my dogs into my office and Please forgive me, I didn't even think of it because I didn't think anything negative, but I said to our office manager, I walked in and I said, well, the crazy ladies, crazy ladies are here, my two dogs, they're females. Well, at this conscious inclusion seminar, he said, you know, when people, says, when people say things like, that weather is crazy out there, you know, we don't think, you know, we don't have any ill intent at all, but we don't think. And, and I, you know, I, I'm a huge proponent of hiring people with disabilities. If I don't get it, think about people who don't have disabilities, what they say. Um, and so my issues, my barriers are 
that with the, the employers, I mean, I have these conversations on a daily basis. They get so frustrated. But the biggest one, and I know we're going to talk about it later, is the Social Security income and the limits on that. So well, I'll save that because I know yeah. I'm going to talk about yeah. that later. But that's huge. They <clears throat> want to hire full-time people that, that want and need to work. And that's a, that's a big problem. So. So, so Steve, Dwight, some of the work that you're doing, how do you think that can help address some of the barriers that uh, Candy has mentioned? Well, I'd love to pick that up. Um, <laughs> think of a construction site and the folks that might be employed there. Um, what you're thinking is true, and it's a tough spot to be. And so when we uh, went down this road, we were trying to, you know, partner with uh, the National Home Builders Association, our local chapters where we operate uh, in their, um, I guess their programs, um, it's escaping me right now, but internship programs. And that was a fail, big fail, just didn't work, never really got off the ground. And there was all these you know, preconceived notions of what people living with disabilities kind of look like or could do. So this opportunity to partner with prime contractors in the construction world, we get to have our workers, who 75% of that direct labor is you know, living with a disability, we get to talk about that, and the folks on that construction site got to see a different world. You know, how, how could we do this work? Were we effective? Could we hit the timelines? And I, I believe that, just experience, like those people working alongside I know, you know, maybe they're talking under their breath at one point, but after, the, you know, a job is completed and it's on time, that construction company likes that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, just this last experience, they're like, hey, do you put up uh, siding as well? So it was just nice that we were, it was very skeptical, and now we're moving towards accepted. And this is right at the beginning, but I know, like, if other organizations um, in our network work towards this goal and try to get into the construction side of things, we might really be able to change the world here. Dwight, any thoughts? Well, it's, it's perception control. <laughs> and, um, you know, having people understand that, you know, it's differing abilities. You know, in, in, in the IT space, and I'm, I'm using that as an example, you know, we've got a, a particular team that is working a contract for uh, the Defense Counterintelligence Security Agency. And it's, it's you know, it's IT work, and it's distributed. So you know, usually transportation is not a problem. Mm -hmm. Where we found the problems there were accessibility software mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for for both uh, persons with uh, you know vision and hearing um, issues. You know, whether whatever scale, and getting that you know they're often working on DoD you know the DoDIN you know DoD information network systems, <coughs> and so being able to have that placed in there so they can do it. When we started kind of working that down the road because of a new hire and started that, that was really the first time that the contracting team, because that contract had been on another, with another agency and had recently shifted over. So they really weren't that familiar with us. They just knew we were a, a, a performing group. And you know, that was the first time they said, why do we need to do this? We have somebody with a, a, a disability that needs, needs the accommodation. And they, they had no problem doing it, but that, that kind of was like, Okay, we've been working with this contract for a while. It's our, and I quote, our best performing group in DCSA. They just don't and, know. And you're telling me that, and so I had to actually stop the conversation and say, are you familiar with the Ability One program? No. They okay. saw it as exactly what I would like for them to see it. We're, we're contractors providing vital services to our nation. They just happen to be persons with differing abilities doing it. Now we have to make some accommodations, and that's what we're here for. And so trying to reinforce that through accommodation, you're getting quality services in different areas than what they're used to seeing. Well, and accommodations are really inexpensive for the most part. Absolutely. They really are. So, so for any of you and all of you, what do Ability One nonprofits offer to other federal contractors that make them an effective partner? And can you speak to any of the cost efficiencies or savings? Well, we also, I'm on the board of BOSMA, Visionary Opportunities Foundation, which is an Ability One um, organization, and we work very closely with them. Um, we 
send them jobs for people. Um, so some of their folks have been hired by our um, employers, members. Um, so that's always a huge benefit. And we all love to see people get hired and, and these people then participate in our, in our um, disability roundtables. And so we've had a lot of benefits there. But I think the biggest thing is the education. And you've said it, I mean, you both have said it, you know, people don't know what they don't know. It's as simple as that. And I don't think that they're opposed. It's just they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they just don't know any better. And, you know, we, we all think that we sound like we can't shut up about it, but mm -hmm. somehow the, the right people aren't hearing us, you know, or at least not enough people are hearing us. Well, you've heard the term, you know, corporate social responsibility, yep. you know, and, and a lot of, and then we've got 503, but, you know, from a business model, the, the, the profit or the, the, you know, what we're trying to bring to them is on certain contracts, especially in like the knowledge-based work and, uh, and some, even some of the uh, construction or facilities management is <clears throat> because we're on the continuum. You have to introduce someone to the work and kind of coach them and grow them in, in some respects, depending upon the, the, what they bring to the table in terms of their skill set. It's that we call them the low margin, high turnover positions. In other words, the idea is we want to grow somebody out of the program. And so starting where they can, you know, again, crawl, walk, run, they can come in and then we can introduce that. For a company like, you know, a large tech firm, you know, that does have some of that work that, you know, they don't want to, you know, it's, it's a lot of churn, well, let us do that churn. Because then I can graduate them up into the prime or the larger company and then wash, rinse, repeat. So that we can kind of keep that flow going. Because like I said, we started with a high-end IT contract and it, it left a few marks. Um, because it, we were learning, as our customer was learning, what the program was. So let's 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 start looking down into where what is reasonable mm -hmm. in terms of what we can and can't do uh, with our veterans. Um, you know, there's really all they need is the training and the accommodation if necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, for some of our other teammates, they may need a little more. So that's where we have to kind of pace it. Mm -hmm. But when we what our value proposition really is is. <clears throat> Let us do. The, let us do the. Let us do the, the lower end stuff to start, and we'll provide you with employees that you can now take, and we'll provide the training. See, that's that's the thing. Bosma, we have Bosma do a lot of um, training, and we literally take members into the Bosma facility, and I've watched them teach people how to use a hammer, you know, hammer a nail in and not hit their thumb, and I do it but being fully sighted, you know, and it, they're amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing, but Ability One could, you know, start putting some of those training modules out or something, you know, I think that would be brilliant. Well, and we have a, a real competitive advantage when you're partnering with contractors. It's, we are federal contractors. You don't have to train us. You want to be a member and what have you said? Yeah, I like it, yeah. It's, you know, you talk about Davis wages, you know, certified payroll, things that oh, yeah. they have to train their subcontractors, yeah. and it's a pain in the butt. Especially and, Davis Bacon payroll. Exactly, <laughs> but we can, you know, come as from experts, and then you're really a valued partner. I know mm -hmm. at Skillskin, we have a mantra, it's like, especially on our commercial work, we're never going to be the cheapest. That's not what we want to provide, mm -hmm. but we will deliver excellent service, and you're going to want to come back and do business with us. And the Ability One program, again, yeah, you don't have to train us. There's the connection. So do you think the government can do anything to incentivize <coughs> collaboration between Ability One and other federal contractors oh, to abs increase disability employment? Absolutely. You know, we've been talking about this at uh, Source America quite a bit, and some of the roundtables that we participate in is, and the ABORs are going to be key. Um, but that's, that's, you know, if you're going to have a contract, go out there and put, you know, you talk about checking certain boxes. I think Larissa talked about checking certain mm -hmm. boxes. Well, you know, I'm not looking for a set aside. I'm not looking for a handout. I'm looking mm -hmm. for the opportunity. And so especially in some of the, 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 the knowledge base or even, you know, higher, you know, construction work, make it an incentive for the, the large company to actually get the work if they include an Ability One NPA. I think that's brilliant. You say, okay, <laughs> you know what? Either a percentage, or we would prefer, if you've got multiple task orders, you're gonna set aside certain task orders that are reasonable and appropriate for the program for us to execute. 
And then if, by doing that, you earn credit on your proposal. Or it's, it's a condition of doing business. We're in the process of working through one where, a, a, and the ABOR was key, they set it in there that you must, you know, to be able to apply, you must be willing to, it's kind of like a small business, uh, mm -hmm. your small business plan. You have to partner with an Ability One nonprofit. There you go. They do that for other contract requirements. Yes. What if they could meet, uh, you know, some of the Section 503 goals by partnering with an Ability One company? Could we write that into <laughs> law? You know, so it, it really comes down to really being, I mean, we've really got to be vocal, but not a zealot. We sell it in terms of, <laughs> yes, we're doing good. This is necessary. We've got a huge population that is so underserved but we're still a business. We're providing quality services because we have to. Otherwise, we lose the work and we fail our customer. And in some places, that's just not an option. I've learned that the hard way. So, so making sure they understand we're, we're not looking for handouts, we're looking for hand ups. I think I heard somebody earlier say, and, and I was at a conference a couple months ago and they said that you know, all these companies are in business to make money. Well, we're nonprofit. I'm not in business to make money, you know. I mean, I'm really not. I'm in business to help my members. You're nonprofits. You're in in business to help your business. You know, just like you said. You know, it's a totally different focus. So. Yeah, when I was in the, I did three years in a for-profit before I took this position, and we called it finding efficiencies, hmm. especially okay. on, you know, firm fixed price. What that meant was, if I, sh if I bid and won for, let's just say, 30 FTEs on a particular piece of work, and I roll in and there are 25 doing the work, I'm not incentivized to replace those five if the work is getting done. Mm -hmm. exactly. Whereas here, I want to find those extra five, because that's what we're here to do. Right. And, and anything that we, we, we find the efficiency for goes right back into providing training so that I can hire the next one. Or finding you know, other partners to work through this or other accommodations that need to be made. So coming out of that, the, and, and you know, we heard LPTA earlier, and, and that's what really frightens me, is if we're going into certain areas where you've got a best value trade off, and then you've got LPTA. I came out of the LPTA and I fight. That one, that was painful, those bids. You're bidding with narrow margins and you're trying to find those efficiencies. And I think you said it best, Steve, we're not the cheapest. That's, yeah. just, that's just a fact Either of life. Either yeah. <laughs> yeah. we. We got to talk. Yep. We got to talk. Yeah, so that's just where we're going to have to find how do we right. express our value proposition when, you know, we talk about IGSA, we talk about, you know, the executive orders increasing minimum wage. And, you know, I think uh, Kim and I were talking about this before. That executive order came out and the services or the departments didn't have the opportunity to, to budget for that. It just hit them. Mm -hmm. And so now we're working with our customers to figure out, okay, okay, before you start just cutting services, which means cutting employees, let's figure out what we can do to help you so that we can, we can make this work because I want to keep these people on the job while we, we, we negotiate. And that's another beautiful thing about the program is I'm not, the rules are a little different and then we can work directly with the contracting officers and come to a consensus to help them so that we can preserve the program. A good piece of news though is that the, the Unemployment rate for people with disabilities went down this past month to 5.8% as opposed to 7.4% um, last month. So, but again, they're probably, because they're trying to expand the definition of disability, they're probably not looking at all the various disabilities out mm -hmm. there. I mean, you know, if a person has migraines, you know, it's mm -hmm. for the most part an invisible disability until you have a migraine, just like diabetes, until you have a low blood sugar reaction or something like that. But I mean, I think we're moving in the right direction, but a whole lot of work has to be done. And I think that's not a real accurate number, but it's what is reported, so. <laughs> is it a crazy <clears throat> idea to give credit or somehow partner an Ability One subcontractor to a federal contractor, tie this, you know, rules together, this, you know, and it seems like a no-brainer to me. And then organizations could see what it's like to employ with disability. Mm -hmm. We heard that like earlier that today, idea. right? I like that it idea. It was like, okay, this is an experiential. Well, here, we could make a little rule. And all of a sudden, Ability One contractors 
across the country could help educate and inform these other federal contractors? Well, Source America's actually got a really good program that, that uh, fortunately GC, amongst several others, uh, even in this room, uh, companies or MPAs are, are joining in on. It's the Mentor Protege. And it, they're trying to build a program. I don't know how many are familiar with the uh, Small Business Administration, uh, All Small Mentor Protege program, but it's, it, it is an excellent opportunity for companies, uh, we'll just say companies that are not in a particular market space to gain that experience because, again, you can't win a contract without past performance. But how do you get the past performance, especially if you're a small? <laughs> Catch 22. <laughs> yep. So, so we're modeling that in Source America. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make a public service announcement for Source America. I'm just excited about the program because we're really going to be diving into this, is where we can go find a partner in a particular industry or an industry that we're in but we're not really far in. And we will, they will be our mentor. We will be the prime. They will be the sub. And then the beautiful part, and that's what we bring to them, is then it gets added to the PL. And they will maintain the work through the cycle, uh, and I think it's a 10-year cycle is what they're looking at. So you take a company like we're one of our partners that we're bringing in, their, their, their state of business goal right now is, hey, we've got to stop losing work. <laughs> you know, because every five years, it recompetes, or they graduate out of their 8A. So it's one of those things that, hey, well, I tell you what, we can help you stop losing work yeah. and, and, and help bootstrap an NPA into an area that we probably aren't as experienced. And that, or you can take another NPA, a larger one that's very familiar with this work, a smaller MPA that is not, and then mentor protege through that. So that is a really excellent opportunity because what we need to do is make more experience so that we bring more to the table in the federal contracting space instead of just our traditional legacy lines of work. So each of you have touched on policy to some degree. So let's talk a little bit more about that. What are some of the policy changes do you think uh, would you like to see happen in order to expand the pipeline? And Kenny, I know you want to get into Social Security, so this is the time <laughs> yeah. to do it. But what are some of the policy, the broader policy um, opportunities that you all see? You, you know, it, I hear it from my members at least on a weekly basis. And Louise Jones at Bosma is a dear friend, and, and I work with her closely. And she said she hears it all the time. Um, and I, I've been a recruiter in my past, and I had a, a lady who was not blind, but who was in a wheelchair, and I mean, perfect candidate, and I was so excited. I wanted to have her come in for an interview, and, and she said, well, I, I really can only work part-time. I, I, you know, you need to know that. And I said, what? And I was, you know, it was like 10 years ago, and I said, what? And she said, yeah, I, I, I only have a limit on how much money I can make, because then I'll lose my, my um, disability income. And I said, what? <laughs> she, I said, well, we'd give you benefits and we'd pay you X amount of money. You could pay for that personal care assistant. She goes, no, I really can't. You know, I mean, I wanted to, I mean, she was like the perfect, you know, I, if any of you have just had the perfect candidate and she was just like everything I wanted and, and she couldn't work part, she could only work part time. And so now the, in the role that I'm in now, I hear it constantly. And um, I, I wrote down some numbers just because I never remember everything, but you know, the Social Security Administration, they set a limit for what your sustainable, gainful, whatever, um, you're basically your work income, it's sustainable, gainful activity, thank you, I just call it SGA, and it's like, ah, what's that acronym mean? <laughs> um, and, and how much you can um, earn without losing your Social Security benefits. And you know, if you, and, and a person who's blind gets more than a person who isn't blind, but there are people who aren't blind who have very serious um, needs and need a personal care assistant as well. And I will tell you, um, the monthly income that's available for work income for the blind is 2000 think about this, $2,460 a month, $29,520 a year. For people who are not blind, it's $1,470, this is for 2023 or $17,640. I was gonna Google, Google the, po the, the poverty rate. I didn't do that, but I mean, that's gotta be pretty darn close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you are um, needing a personal care assistant, average $35 an hour, you need them 40 hours a week, $1,400 a week. If you need them 56 hours a week, seven days a week, $1,970 a week. And they're gonna be getting $2,460 uh, $2, a month before their social security. 
So, I mean, what choice do they have? Do they either, um, you know, if they're blind and they need a personal care assistant, um, they have to make a choice. To, that's my that's my disability. My pump is going off, so sorry. Um, <clears throat> you know, they have to either give up their Social Security benefits or they take a job that pays less than thirty thousand dollars a year. I mean, and and we are holding government contractors to a you know a aspirational goal of bringing seven percent of people that have disabilities into our workforce, how badly do we want to be successful at that? Don't get me started, because I'm just like, a, <laughs> I'll let you guys talk for a minute. I'll add more later. <laughs> Can Dwight's, you tell that's like my pet peeve? <laughs> Dwight, Steve, what's on your wish list? Well, you heard it here. Let's build a bridge between 503 and the Ability One program. Yep, yep. I like that. Let's there just do go. that. Let's put, like some teeth and some, put, put teeth into it. Yeah. You know, make it real. So that they understand, you know, that, and, and then to meet your 503 goals, let's introduce you to the Ability One program as a subcontractor to help you out with that. You know, even if it's just, hey, we can help you understand how to provide accommodations. I mean, at GC, and I'm sure like most of you, we've got, we've got job coaches, we've got our target employment navigators, and, and, and a team of people who are, that are empathetic and understand what it takes. So let us, let us help you out with that to meet that goal, but you got to meet the goal. You know, that one, uh, the big one, the 1% spend. Let's get it into the NDAA and put teeth into it so that the federal government is going to do that. Uh, I think I heard some numbers earlier this morning on how much the percentage goes to the small business, you know, small business set-asides, but there's no mention of Ability One. The ABORs are a great start and they're doing good stuff, but we really need to have an emphasis placed on that underserved, population that really, and it doesn't matter, and this was coming from uh, another congressional uh, contact we had yesterday when we explained the program to him, you know, he was looking at it, he goes, you know, this is something that I don't understand why it's not gaining more traction. Because it doesn't matter your ethnicity, your religion, your orientation, Disabil uh, disability doesn't discriminate. That's, that's my favorite saying. I, yes. I tell people, target your hiring people with disabilities. You hit every protected class. Exactly. <laughs> every protected yeah, class. So, Craig said it too. But we, need, but we need legislation to do that. Exactly. And, and that would be an easy push. So we're going to open it up for questions, but Steve, do you have anything you want to add to that real quick before we... I just was going to add, um, we have to fix income limits. Oh. With the... <laughs> the fast, you know, rising minimum wage, and we just saw what happened to the federal minimum wage, like that takes away someone's ability to work if yes. or choose benefits or try to pay for it themselves. And we already know yeah. those numbers don't support it. It won't. It, exactly. I mean, it's like I said, it's barely poverty level. We just have to take the economic handcuffs off of people with disabilities who can Please. and want to work. I, I mean, we just have to do that. And, and you know, the, the Social Security Administration needs to, to raise that, that um, work income is the sustainable gainful activity <laughs> number, the SGA. Um, you know, if, if we as a society want to, you know, encourage people with disabilities, people who are blind, to lead lives that they want to lead to support their themselves, their families, their destinies, I mean, doesn't that make sense? So let's get some questions from the audience. Go ahead. My name is Cheryl Bates Harris and I work for the National Disability Rights Network. And I have to tell you, when I hear people talking about people can't work because they're going to lose their social security disability benefits, there's a totally flip side to that story and I think most people are not informed. Since 2000, social security has made some pretty significant improvements in the work incentives. And if people understand them, they can use them, and I'm wondering what the Ability One programs are doing in terms to educate people about that, because for years what we heard is it's not about the wages, it's about losing the access to health care. And both in the SSI program and the SSDI program, those benefits will continue for a long period of time. And I just get really, really annoyed when people buy into this, I can't go to work because I'm going to lose my benefits. What that really tells me is I want to game the system rather than I want to become self-sufficient and independent because the whole purpose 
If we protect people's benefits, and I am deadly serious about this, especially folks who are on SSI, we are dooming them to a life of poverty, and there is no reason that people can't gradually work off and increase their benefits rather than continue to protect them. So I guess my real question is, who's providing the benefits counseling and the information? Because it's not just Social Security work incentives. There's other safety nets, such as the ABLE, and I know we've already talked about 26, but there's lots of things that people can do without reducing their hours or reducing their pay. Thoughts? Well, I'm happy to pick that up just for Washington State, Montana, you know, Wyoming. In Washington, uh, we have an organization that has the CUX, and you, we help employees go and learn about their benefits. Well, they're never available. So that's, uh, I, I've bought into what you've described. I, I hope it's not true that we, there are a way that you can work and not lose your benefits. We, we just haven't seen it. Well, the issue around availability, they're, they're a limited program. They're a $30 million program in Social Security. But there's nothing to stop other people buying those services, especially if it will help them retain long-term employees. So it's the free services that people aren't available because the demand is greater than the supply. But there are also a lot of programs that could buy into those services and pay for them and help reduce a lot of turnover in their own staff. I need to talk louder. <laughs> so this is Cindy Watson. I'm the president and CEO of the San Antonio Lighthouse. And I'd, I'd actually like to respond to the question that you ask about what are we doing as Ability One. Um, so what we are doing in San Antonio is uh, we've actually are, are participating in several programs. And we've gotten several of our vocational rehabilitation professionals certified to provide benefits counseling, and we're providing that service free of charge to both our employees who are blind as well as the community of people who are blind that want to access those services. So um, we recognize and acknowledge that that is an issue. I personally, as a person who's blind, uh, experienced and had to uh, figure out my way of navigating overcoming and being on benefits and transitioning as a professional post-college. So it is an issue that we deal with, and we are tackling it, and I'm not the only agency that's providing those services. So just as an information point, we are doing, there are things that we're doing within the program to address those challenges. I think a, a big issue, too, is that some of the people who get the services do understand it. We work with voc rehabs. Maybe that's something that we could do is help get some folks with voc rehabs, and, and I know we work with Lighthouse in various um, cities, maybe have them educate the employers, because the employers don't know a lot about this. I think the people that are blind or, you know, or, or have you know, serious disabilities where they have those concerns with Social Security income um, or SSDI, they get it. You know, some, of, some of the folks do, but I think maybe in, um, educating the employer is beneficial as well. And I'd like to talk with you if you'd like to help educate my, my members. <laughs> I'd love to have, I'd love right. to talk with you. <laughs> we, have, we have a question over here. Yeah, uh, Zach Tamer with CGI Federal. Um, just had a question about uh, the possibility, I guess, uh, knowing the knowledge-based contract you had before um, as a prime contractor under a pilot where the DLR got to be dropped to around 52% as opposed to the 75%. Is it possible for Ability One to grant a pilot as a for you to come in, say, as a sub, where it's a smaller piece instead of just coming in pilot as prime, right? So if you came in as a sub, then it becomes a much easier way to kind of become a feeder into you know the the natural transition that they want to see in Ability One, anyways, right? So from Ability One role into prime contractor role. So I'm going to, uh, to make sure that I don't outstep my experience with that. Um, but that, that's a real question for the commission in that we, there is a process for us to ask to, to adjust based on what we're doing. And it is my understanding that 
that in a lot of, especially a lot of these emerging lines of business, that there is an opening there for us to, to be able to kind of work through the process to say, yeah, we can't get there, or what is our on-ramp to get to the appropriate ratio? I know we're talking a lot about you know, re opening uh, Javits Wagner O'Day and trying to adjust that, you know, again, for the interest of competitive and integrated employment, but it's also a process by which we need to understand the work itself and what's appropriate for us to be doing, okay? But the sub role gives us some flexibility, but we still have to, we still have to meet the requirement. And so, you know, that's a long way to say, yes, I believe there is a way, but like everything, there's a process. All right. I have a question back here, and then one up here. I said no heckling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the two guys in the middle. <laughs> Trouble. I mean, I do know about the two guys in the middle, but y'all don't want to hear it. Well, maybe you do. Um, there's a couple of points that I wanted to make. One is that you talked earlier about uh, disability in the workforce. And only about 20% of all disabled people are even attached to workforce numbers. So when that disability unemployment oh. rate goes down, you're really just talking about. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. That's why I said I don't think the numbers are really accurate. <laughs> the Disability Rights Network in the background, we provide case management on a person-by-person -person basis because we don't want someone to lose and we have people who come off a disability, but there are some other things that complicate that in the disability world where I live. One of them is that many of those people with disabilities work such interrupted work, have such interrupted work histories mm -hmm. that they don't qualify for disability, social security. Mm -hmm. They don't even qualify for social security retirement. Another issue that we wind up having is that there's only 9 million of 61 million people currently on social security disability and they have a 63% denial rate. I went through a period of catastrophic illness mm -hmm. um, and a disability that I still live with today. And it took me two years and a lawyer to even be considered for disability. Now I wound up getting it for a closed period because then I went right back to work. Um, but those are things that are barriers to people who don't read well, don't speak well, don't have access to technology, don't have access to transportation, to health care. We're talking about the most marginalized population. So that MPAs really look at our people very holistically. We really care about our people holistically. And we have people trained by the Social Security Administration. We have two. And we provide that to every person in our building that either wants to be on Social Security or is currently on Social Security. Thank you. Great, thanks. Question up front. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Anita Bruno. Um, I represent the Rhode Island Women in the Trades. Steve, I have a really big question for you. What are, or what's your relationship like, or what is the conversation like with the union building trades? <laughs> and what would that look like? Um, trying to create and enhance and, and kind of grow that going forward um, so that they could start accepting into the union apprenticeships? Well, I wish I had a lot to talk about on that. <laughs> I'll invite me back here a year from now. <laughs> I'll have more info. Uh, we have just one experience where um, someone from the Ability One program wanted to get into the electrical union and she um, you know, took went through that process, we helped supported her, and she is now in the union. Um, so we're learning more and figuring out how we can connect uh, with that group. But right now, I wish I had some answers. I really don't, that's all I got. I, um, I learned a lot these past couple of hours within this conference. And um, one of the biggest things that comes to mind from my own personal experience, I'm, um, I'm a union carpenter, 16 years. Wow. And I um, met a young lady who has really high anxiety and high depression. Um, and it's been diagnosed for years since she was young. And um, as one of our business agents tried to advocate for her in some of the uh, accommodations she needed, um, some of the managers and other agents would be like, you know, why are you going on a limb for this girl? And he would just explain, you know, she's a member. Um, but there's a lot more conversation on opioid use and drug, um, drug abuse than there is about disability. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd really love to continue the conversation and see how we could work together to change that. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, right now. Go ahead. 
this is a marriage made in heaven because we need the accessibility built and she builds it. Right. So if we could yeah. get more people to work in our community yeah. to take the $5,000 grant that my state is offering to all small businesses and they can build it, you can build it. This is the marriage made in heaven, everybody warns. Well, and you know, one thing, your, your point just now, um, coworkers are so supportive of their, of their buddies who have disabilities. Absolutely. I mean, they are so supportive. And you know, as an employer, don't you want to get rid of silos and have you know, people that work well to, together collaborate you know, and, and do things, you know, get, get the work accomplished and support one another? I mean, that's, that is a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> you know. I'll take the host prerogative since I can ask any questions. <laughs> Um, in terms of relationships with unions, um, so Melwood has had an interesting time of, of it. We, we have a lot of unions uh, that are at our contract, SCIU, La Una, um, the Teamsters, the mechanics, machinists, et cetera. Um, and it's been, a tough, it's been a tough marriage in some cases in terms of, of serving people with disabilities. We've had some locals uh, not want to include people with disabilities um, into the unions with some dicta being, you know, it would raise their their health insurance rates um, mm -hmm. on the union's um, so, health plan. So <laughs> and, you know, why should we add people with disabilities into this local? You guys already pay them the same amount anyway, <laughs> and what, what benefit would we add? Um, but, and, but with respect to building trades particularly, um, you know, we've, we've been trying to, in, to, to, to work with the unions to have people with disabilities go through the apprenticeship program. And it was a little bit of a tough sell. Um, you know, the unions have their lists of members who want into these apprenticeship models. And we kind of had to push it on one of them and say, listen, for this position, we have this amazing candidate that's worked with us for all these years. He's shifting to this contract. This is what he wants to do. You know, you either take this person for the apprenticeship or we're not doing an apprenticeship at this site. And, 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 and they, they interviewed him, he went through the process, and now he is an apprentice. And you know, in a few years, he'll have his license, and he'll be able to have any job that he wants at a much, much higher salary. Um, and we need to do a lot more of that. I'd love to cultivate more of these conversations um, with unions to talk about what the barriers are for people with disabilities in, in joining unions and in getting these apprenticeships, because in some cases, it might be the nonprofits or the employers that might not kind of understand and are standing in the way. But in a lot of cases, like ours, we embrace that and want them to be to be equally considered and treated. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. And I saw a few hands go up. Anybody? Letting us off easy. All right. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank. Candy, Steve, and Dwight for sharing her thoughts and insights today and fielding some questions. I'd like to thank Larissa and her team for hosting this, uh, this forum and for inviting me to uh, participate. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Here we go. Thank you so much, Jim, and to our panelists. Um, I really love conversations like this because I feel like this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we can really start to figure out how do we make partnerships work? How do we build relationships? How do we ensure, you know, there's both a business case to be made for hiring people with disabilities, but there's also just, let's hire people with disabilities. <laughs> like, you know, everyone deserves the dignity of a job and a dignity of work. And so I love these kind of conversations because they really start to bring it home. Um, so we've heard some incredible and influential speakers today, a true testament to the role each one of us in the room must play if we're going to transform federal procurement from a mechanism to a true strategy in advancing inclusive employment for people with disabilities. But you can't have a policy conference without bringing up policymakers. Public policy is one of the most critical fields in advancing civil rights and inclusion. Policy changes are the incremental but monumental ways in which our society changes the course of history and in so doing, charts the path towards permanent social change. It's a process, and I think sometimes we take for granted all the time, stakeholders, and considerations that go into that process. We're honored to have with us today some of the congressional and committee staff who have been instrumental